Hi everyone and welcome to CBUC, Seattle Blender User Group. Uh, it's cool to see some new faces here. Uh, I am Oscar Beckler. I've been doing this for about seven years now. Uh, I started it way back when I got my first job out of college and had to use Blender. And we've been going ever since. It's wonderful. Uh, I teach here at Lake Washington. And they, uh, they let us use our the campus for Seabug, so good job, Lake Washington Institute of Technology. Well, they did that before you started. Yeah, that's true. Um, so, uh, anyways, yeah, we're here to learn Blender. Who else is here? Let's introduce ourselves. Uh, my name's Alan Bob. I'm just Hi, I'm Matt. Um, this is my first time using Blender. I'm Adam, and I've been using Blender for about half a year. I've been using Blender for a couple of years. Um, yeah. I'm Joey. I've mainly been using Blender to make like uh, smoothies and stuff. But <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty, pretty good so far. <laughs> I'm Matthew. I'm an artist, and I've been using Blender since about 2000, end of 2012. I'm Bob. I've been using Blender for at least four years. David, uh, you have been Blender for a couple of years. Uh, another David, about a year and a half in Blender. Uh, I've been using Blender for about three years now. And uh, Paul, this is completely new. Cool. So, let's confirm. We have, who here is very new to Blender? Alright. That's enough that I'll probably do a little bit of a beginner tutorial. Uh, we try to keep Seabug as a forum where you can have it be your first jumping off point into computer graphics. So hopefully that works out. We've got a couple other things on the itinerary. I was going to talk about high dynamic range lighting for computer graphics, how to assemble it. And that's sort of a more expert topic, but very fun to listen to and learn about because uh, we were talking about it last time. Uh, wait, no. Who else do we got here? More attendees. Introduce yourself. Oh, my name is Mark. I'm Sean. Okay. So let's start off in Blender and do just a tutorial for complete beginners. And hopefully this will help you just dive in. For all you experts out there uh, who might be totally bored with this and possibly this is like your 17th time hearing me do this kind of tutorial. Uh, you have a, a speed modeling challenge, which is cybernetic turkey. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like Thanksgiving themed, right? Make a cybernetic turkey. You have an hour, go. All right, for the rest of you, let's start up Blender. And uh, I want you guys to possibly take notes as you go because you're very new at this. Uh, you can either use Notepad Ooh, there's Notepad. Uh, if I always feel bad showing this because it's a great way to take notes in Blender, but if you're new to Blender, it's probably very scary. Which is, all these parts of the Blender interface have little windows. So this is a window. This tiny strip down here is a window. That's the timeline. And this is a window. And this is sort of Blender's basic layout. Is It's one giant window composed of different slices of other windows. So you can use these pull downs to make different ones, such as a text editor. And you know. You could just take your notes right there if you want. But if that's too hard, don't worry about it. Just use a notepad or something. And take sh uh, take note of shortcuts as we go along. 3D is sort of a difficult subject to get into and knowing all your shortcuts is very important. You also might want to use like Google Docs. So yeah, yeah. Them. Google Docs is good because then you'll save it and you can sort of keep it as a journal entry. So let's start off with looking at this interface. There's a couple things worth knowing. Again, you can use these little pull downs, which are like right here. So you can use these pull downs like there, there. And here to change these different windows around. And they sort of mark out different areas, such as this being your outliner. 
It's where you can see all the 3D scene objects, uh, whether it's like an actual object such as this cube or this camera, or uh, more abstract things like the world setting. You have this window, which is You have this window, which is your properties window. And that's where you're going to do lots of under the hood setup stuff. You also have this timeline. We're going to ignore that. You're going to start seeing that when you do animation. But when you're getting started in 3D, you want to mostly focus on uh, something simple like object manipulation, maybe sculpting, or just basic object. And then the main one is this big 3D window, which is the one we're mostly going to be focusing on. And what can be kind of complex is that this has sub-windows, which are your tools, which are activated with the T-Hot key. And if I press N on this, so if I press N, this brings up the transform properties, or the, uh, I guess the properties tab. Kind of one of my gripes about them. So these are sub-windows. And this hot key is T, this hot key is N. And you also might notice something right off the bat about how Blender works, which is its hotkeys are context sensitive <coughs> to your mouse. So if you have your mouse over here and you press T or N, it's not going to work because it's saying your mouse is in the properties window, so I'm going to do property window shortcuts. If your mouse is over here, your mouse. Now when you hit T or N, it's going to say, I'm in the 3D window. That's my context for the window. So I can bring up the tools or the properties. And so for instance, uh, you know, when you get into different things, uh, hotkeys like A for select all are going to change things. Yeah? The properties in the 3D window is display properties versus the property panel, which is object Yeah, it's, it's, uh, oh, no, and it's also like your transforms are here. Uh, again, it's not the best naming convention. There's properties here, there's properties here. There's another area of Blender where they secretly have properties, but whatever. So that's your basis. And we don't have to care about that yet because we're mostly just going to be focusing on this giant 3D viewport window. Okay. So with your mouse, again, in the 3D context of this 3D window, so I have my mouse over here, we can start learning some of the basics of how to navigate your 3D scene. And the first one we're going to do is your basic viewport navigations. And all of these go through the middle mouse button. So if you middle mouse click and drag, you can start to orbit around your scene. For those of you who took my drawing class, uh, or are currently in it. Hey, look at that. Instant perspective. Stick a piece of paper here, and you trace it, and you're done. You get an A. Ha ha ha. Why are we learning how to draw it by hand? We could cheat with 3D. So again, middle mouse, click and drag, orbits around here. And you're going to notice a couple things. Again, a lot of times your mouse is context sensitive. So if I click over here, that changes how it moves. Whereas if I click here, it changes how I move. And it's also really good to use lots of small movements rather than one giant one. So don't just middle mouse and try forever to get the proper view. It's OK to build this out in multiple small incremental movements. So that's the first of your three basic viewport navigations. The second one is panning. If you hold shift and middle mouse click drag, now you can pan around your 3D scene. Orbit and pan. And the third one, which you've probably been doing by accident already, is middle mouse wheel in and out. Look at that. That's zoom. You can also hold control and middle mouse click drag, and this gives you a little bit more fine-tuned control. So I always encourage beginners to just spend uh, even just 30 seconds when you first open a, a 3D program doing a little meditative exercise of orbit, pan, and zoom. 
just to reacquaint yourself with 3D space. And you know, if you're jumping from application to application, you're going from this to Unity or back and forth between Maya and this, uh, it's all the same layout, it's just different buttons. So that's the first thing you do is just reset your muscle memory to whatever the basic three viewport transforms are. And if you're taking notes, you could take notes by saying three view now. Orbit B for middle mouse button. Pan shift not shit. And zoom. So again, I take notes all the time when I'm learning a new program. It's uh, a very good way to learn. Now I break 3D down into three rules of three because a lot of the early concepts that you have to learn go really well together in groups of three. So this is the first of those three, which is your basic three viewport navigation. There's other ways that you can navigate your 3D scene, such as the number pad on your keyboard, which is different from the number line. And this has a couple of uh, shortcuts to get you moving. So for instance, five on a number pad switches between orthographic and 3D rendering. This is three-dimensional. Things recede as they approach the horizon. And this is Final Fantasy Pokemon, right? Oftentimes you use orthographic for things such as modeling to a blueprint where you're trying to see like a cutaway that's very specific. Uh, you need something that's very much a top view and you don't want to see like uh, a building whose windows are spaced differently because they're receding into perspective. Or you just like it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, a lot of times I just go into it and I model that way for a while. Another thing, the other hotkeys that are good to know on the number pad are 7, 1, and 3, which switch between top view, front view, and side view. And I think you can add shift to do the reverse, or control to do the reverse of these. So 7 is top view, control 7 is the bottom view. 1 is front view, control 1 is the back view. 3 is the side view, and control 3 is the other side view. I think it's left, or right first and then left second. Other hotkeys that are very important in your uh, number pad are very helpful for this. Plus and minus is just another shortcut for zooming in and out. 4, 8, 6, and 2. Uh, if your number pad has arrows on it, it actually corresponds to that. So 8 is up and 2 is down, and you can orbit around your scene using these. And then similarly, just like using shift and the middle mouse button to change how you pan, you can hold shift, all right, control, and 8, 4, 6, and 2 to pan. Period on the number pad zooms to your selected object. And this is an important one to know because a lot of times in 3D, you lose the context of where you are in 3D. You get lost in the endless desert of three-dimensional space, and I don't know where I'm going now. I'm rotating, I'm orbiting, but my objects are so far away that they might even stop being visible because they get clipped. So this is why period is valuable, in that in our outliner, we can just left-click to select an object. And if I hit period, it'll zoom to that new context. So it's a good way to reorient yourself when you get lost. And this is the last one for our number pad shortcuts. The zero key switches to your camera view. This is important for later on when you start rendering. This camera is a 3D object and you know we can move it around manually. But it's good to oftentimes check how your render is going to come out, which is eventually when you hit F12 and this pops up. So all this middle mousing is probably where beginners should start, but it's not where your instinct tells you to start. Your instinct when you open a new program, if I'm correct, is you start trying to left click on stuff, right? And oh god, nothing's happening! So that, that ring is moving. This stupid ring is moving around. Well this is called Blender's 
3D cursor. And like a cursor on a word processing program, when you enter a new character on your keyboard, it enters on that word processing cursor. When you create new objects in 3D, it enters in at this 3D cursor. This becomes important later on uh, when we start using it to set contextually where we want things to happen. But for now, just don't worry about it. Let it, let it fade into the background. Uh, stop being frustrated with left click for a little bit. What you probably wanted left click to be is what right click is in Blender. If you right click on an object, it selects it. And similarly, shift right click deselects. You can toggle that. You can also hold shift right click to add to selection. So here I right click on my 3D cube. I hold shift and I right click on this light to add it to selection. And I hold shift and add this camera to selection. Oh, the cybernetic turkey's coming along. Ah. Oh, Dean's got something going. Very neat. <coughs> so we have the three basic viewport transformations, right? Orbit, pan, and zoom. We have three basic mouse buttons, and these do different things, but in general what you can know is that right click is selection, left click is 3D cursor, and middle mouse is your 3D viewport button. And now that we're using right click to select, we can get into the next rule of threes as I think of it, which is how to approach problems in 3D, which is a three-step process of orbit. All right, step one is you want to get the proper selection. No, wait. Scratch that. Step one of any 3D problem is what we've already been doing, which is get the proper view. If I'm looking like this, how do I select my cube? I can't see what I'm doing. So I have to get to the point where I can see it. If I have a viewport like this, where somehow I've specifically aligned the planets, as it were, so that my light my camera and my cube are all in the same area, this is going to make it harder to select. So if I get the proper view, I'm going to have a proper start to whatever 3D problem I'm try trying to solve. So now that I have this proper view, I can go to step two of this process, which is make the proper selection. Now when I start right-clicking, I can make the proper selection. And there's lots of other secret uh, select tools that are going to come in handy in 3D. Uh, step two of making selections is a very robust process in 3D. So as an example, try hi hitting the A key on your keyboard while your mouse is in the 3D viewport. This toggles between select all and select none. So that's one quick shortcut for step two of making the proper selection. Another good shortcut is control and left click. What this does, control and left click drag, enters lasso select for objects. So it's a very handy way to do something like I want to select my cube but not my camera. Oh, yeah, just a little bit. I want to select my light, my cube, but not my camera. I can use lasso select to do it. When you get into polygons and you have 500 little vertices on the screen, this is going to be a very good way to make selections very fast. Other good selection hotkeys are B for border select, which is another quick thing uh, that we can see. And border select is a good way to see another level of interface in Blender. When I hit B, I get this crosshair, right? If I left click, it selects using the border select tool. If I hit B, uh, and again, I hit A to toggle, so I have nothing selected first. Now if I hit B and I hit right click, it cancels this. So this is another level of Blender that uh, usually cascades through all the tools in it. Left click is execute and right click is cancel. So just keep that in mind when you start going into other tools and it's going to come in very handy. So for instance, B, left click here. Some of these tools that I'm showing for selection, such as control and left click, you can add shift and add another layer to this tool. So for instance, control left click, lasso select, control and shift left click, Lasso deselects. Similarly, B for border select, 
or box select. Does a box selection. B and then holding shift while I left click and drag, deselects using a box selection. But primarily what you should have wired into your brain is that left click when inside of a tool, it's kind of like you're entering into a separate program, left click executes it and right click cancels it. So step one, get the proper view. Step two, make the proper selection. And step three is when you do the final step of perform an action. And this is where usually people start in 3D and they jump to it. They say, I want to delete my cube. How do I do that? Well, first you have to select it. Or first you have to be able to see your cube even. Then you have to select it. And then you can do an action, such as delete, which is either the delete key or the X key is also a way to delete objects. And this is sort of where you start seeing the fun of 3D in that there's thousands and thousands of actions you can perform, such as parenting objects. So I can select this and then this. And control P is parent. And now this object is a child of this object. If you're familiar with other 3D programs or if you want to just go by instinct, this is where we start using menus a lot. You might have noticed down here, again, this little area is the 3D viewport and we can see that in this window pull down where we can switch what program we're, or what uh, window we're inside of. And connected to that pull down is the header for this specific type of window. In this case, the 3D view header. This is going to have menus that has extra commands. And you can see that it's already broken up into this sort of three-step process, which is uh, how do you view your object correctly? How do you select your object correctly? And how do we either add new objects or perform an action on our existing object? Uh, play around in these menus, and it's a great way to learn other hotkeys. One thing I really like about Blender is how exposed the UI is. I wish Maya did this. Uh, you'll notice that after every command, it tells you what the hotkey is. And actually, if you hover over it and just let the mouse do its work, a little tooltip pops up. So what does make proxy do? That's an empty object that becomes a local replacement you know, of a library linked object, whatever that means. What about move to layer? Moves the object to a different layer. There's a couple shortcuts to get to menus that are very handy because it's sort of time consuming to go over here and say add and then go through here. So some of these other menus that let you get to these commands a little faster include shift A, which is the add menu. So here I can see add a mesh, let's add a cylinder. And where did it come in? It came in at that 3D viewport cursor, or 3D cursor. So if I set that over here and say add a meta ball, but ellipsoid, there it is. Metaballs are fun. They have a lot less application than I want. They really do. <laughs> I want to shoot them out of a particle system, you know? That's what metaballs should be about. You can't get them out of a particle system, it's kind of strange. Yeah. So again, shift A is the add menu. Another hot uh, menu that's very useful is the spacebar. If you hit spacebar, it brings up a search window. This is especially useful if you are familiar with other 3D programs or just general programming conventions or program conventions because a lot of times it lets you get to what you need very fast. So for instance, you could search something like delete and you can see all the ways that uh, it inserts something. What if you are familiar with 3ds Max or Maya and you understand things like animation and setting keyframes? You might search key and various keyframe oriented things come up. What about parenting? Right. If you search parenting and you understand parenting from a Maya or Max uh, workflow or a, you know Unity or even Photoshop layers can be parented to a group. Uh, you know the same context or concepts scale across other programs. So use the spacebar and you can find it a little quicker.
Another menu that's pretty useful is the W menu, which brings up the specials. And specials is sort of a context sensitive menu. What it does is it gives you options based on whatever selection and mode you're in. So if you're in an animation setup or you have bones selected, it'll give you bone oriented tools. Right now we have an object selected, a 3D mesh object, and that doesn't have a lot of options. But let's say I select my camera here. Well now I can use W and I can see things like camera lens angle. I'll do that while I'm viewing this. So you don't have to do all this, but let's say now I have my camera selected and I've hit W to go into my camera view. Now if I use something like camera lens angle, I can change this from an 18 millimeter super zoomed in camera, or wait, super zoomed out, to a 135 millimeter telephoto lens. The light has specific ones to it, such as the energy and the fall off. If you go into the light properties, you can actually visibly see these things. So that's one that's kind of useful for later. All right, so we're making a proper viewport. Or we're getting the proper view in the viewport. We're making the proper selection, and now we're performing actions. And now we can go into the next stage, which is mesh editing. You guys want to do mesh editing or sculpting? I kind of like sculpting. Let's sculpt. Sculpting is more fun. Usually when I'm teaching beginners, I go with one of two options for learning this stuff. One is hitting tab, which enters into the separate mode. And you can see down here on the 3D viewport, over here, the so you can use this pull down here. You can use this pull down right here to change your mode, or you can hit tab to go into edit mode. And this lets you select individual verts and move them around. Oh, that's what we need to learn there. Scratch that. Don't go into edit mode yet. In fact, create a whole new scene with Control N. So the next. Rule of three we're going to cover is your basic transforms in 3D space. This is how you move an object around. So we know how to orbit around our cube and a pan and zoom in and get it to the view that we like. And we know how to select it. We don't want to select our light. We don't want to select our camera. We want to select our cube. So we right click on it. Well, now we can perform an action. And there's three actions that are the most common ones you do in 3D, which are your basic transforms. Again, I mentioned that N is the properties panel. And I'll ask that you toggle that on right now. Because up here, you can see the basic transforms. And this is going to give us some feedback as we start seeing these transforms. So step three, we want to do an action. And you might have already tried doing this on your own using these little arrows in the 3D scene. If you left click on them, you can actually use them as a tool. You can switch between location, rotation, and scale using these little buttons down here on the viewport menu header. <laughs> this button toggles the entire thing on and off. But you'll notice that when you change it, this changed values. And you can actually change these manually by typing numbers in. So for instance, under location, type in 1, and then tap down just like in, I don't know, Excel or a website, 2 and 3. And our cube is moving to these values in Cartesian 3D space. How exciting. But there's a much smarter way to do this which is using hotkeys. Blender has a great feature, which is lazy mouse trans uh, transformations. What that means is instead of using these arrows or typing in numbers, somewhere in your 3D scene, hit G to enter grab mode. 
And now you are grabbing your 3D cube, and you can see how it's moving around in 3D space. This gives you a very organic way to move things around in a way that's very light on your wrist damage. Uh, you're not clicking down to do this. So after modeling for 12 hours a day, you're going to get carpal tunnel syndrome if you're just using those little arrows. So this is a way to sort of prevent that damage. It is, it is a lot faster, too. I mean, it's like maybe a third of a second that it takes to find the wheel. But times yeah. that over, again, 12 hours of doing yeah. nothing but pushing verts. Pushing polygons, as they say. As I mentioned, with Blender tools, there's a general mnemonic, which is left-click executes and right-click cancels. So I'm going to hit left-click to execute it. And you'll notice that when I left-click, it's placed in that spot. I'll hit G again and left click over here, or G in there. G and left click, G and left click. <coughs> you can also use right click to cancel. So if I moved off screen and I realized, no, don't move up there, cube, I can hit right click and it'll cancel and go back over here. Instead of left click and right click, you can also use escape to cancel, or you can use enter to execute. Just different ways of doing things. Another good thing to know is that let's say you did some sort of crazy translation. Your cube is out here in space and look at all these hideous numbers. You could go in and type 000 in or you can actually hit delete over these but we're not going to do that but what is it, backspace. You can hit backspace over your uh, values and it'll zero out. But actually the most important one to know, in my opinion, is that it's G for grab and Alt-G to clear out your grab transforms. So Alt-G, all my location values are now nice and clean. Alt-G to move it, Alt-G to clear it. There's also some contextual things to our cube that we can add that will make its movements a little more precise. One of the things that's not good about hitting G is we're just floating nebulously in space. And in 3D, you're often trying to do something with a lot more precision. Well, you can add that precision in Blender uh, inside of this tool. So while we're inside of this tool, I can hit X to move on the X axis, Y to move on the Y axis, or Z to move on the Z axis. What are X, Y, and Z? Well, first off, they correspond to R, G, and B, or red, green, and blue. So if you're curious, uh, R equals X, Y equals G, and B equals Z. Star in the corner shows you. Yeah, it does show you. Along global Z. <coughs> Z is up and down in Blender. Uh, depending on your 3D program, that's different. Sometimes they use Y as up and down. Uh, X is left and right, and Y is forward and back. So if I want to move this just up and down, I can hit Z, and it'll do that. I can also type in a specific number to get an exact amount. So let's say I want to move this on the x-axis 5 units. I can hit G for grab, X for x-axis, and 5 for 5 units, and it'll go right there. And again, Alt-G will clear that out. What about this next? Those are Blender units, right? Yes. Uh, and you can set your units in the, uh, in, uh, world. in the, no, world. the world, the, uh, the scene value. So over here, I can go units and switch it to metric, but that's getting ahead of ourselves. So this next one is rotation, and rotation functions the same way. I can hit R for rotation, and it's just rotating lazy mouse style. I can type in a specific axis, such as Z, so that I'm only rotating along the z-axis, kind of like you're spinning, twirling, twirling, twirling towards freedom. Thank you, Joey. So I can hit R for rotate, Z for uh, z-axis, and I could type in a specific mathematical value, such as 45 degrees. And there you'll notice in the top view, it's exactly 45 degrees rotation. And just like with grab, Alt plus the hotkey clears it out. So Alt R clears out your rotation values.
Rotation also gives us a great example of the context of your 3D cursor. Try rotating when your cursor is right on top of your cube. It's impossible to know what's happening, right? That's because the context that it had was for your 3D cursor, which was essentially one pixel over here. But it might have been one pixel over here. So very quickly, you're noticing that I'm getting crazy values of like 23,000 rotation units. So when you rotate, you also don't want to necessarily be over here, where it might be very hard to make these changes. So you don't necessarily want to be right over your subject matter when you rotate. So something over here lets me actually see a subtle rotation amount. And now I can go in a circle and do it a little more precisely. So R, Z, 45 degrees, did a specific one. Alt, R, cleared it out. There's a couple other hotkeys that are very cool for a rotation. One example is the difference between this, which is turntable rotation. You'll notice that it's rotating the cube as if the cube is on a turntable facing directly toward us. And trackball rotation, or joystick rotation. If I hit R a second time, instead it's going to operate as if my cursor is a look at target and it's trying to look at this cursor. Oftentimes this is very useful in rigging because, or not rigging, but animation, because you're doing something like you're moving an arm and you need to place it really organically. And so turntable isn't what you want, you want trackball. And just for the sake of showing something interesting, give your cube a really funky rotation. And now hit R and then double Z. You'll notice that this chart starts rotating it differently. Instead of rotating it on the global Z axis with RZ, RZZ is going to rotate on the local Z axis. So it's going to find this Z axis orientation and try to follow along it rather than specifically along it. And if we go back to grab, we can see the same thing. GXX is going to grab it on our local X axis. Alt-G, Alt-R clears it up. The last one is scale, which is S. And you'll notice this is making my cube bigger and smaller. Uh, it's a multiplicative value, so you'll notice its default is 111. And Alt-S clears out to 111. And the same things apply. S, X, or S, Z scales it on the Z axis. And there's one last qualifier that we're going to talk about for these basic transforms, which is uh, how to restrict an axis. So let's say I want to move, let's say this is like a building, and I'm not sure where I want to place it on the floor, but I know I want to place it on the floor somewhere. I can use G for uh, grab, and now it's floating up in space. I want it to move somewhere organically, but not up and down. I can use Shift Z, and it'll say everywhere except the Z axis. So now I can move it everywhere except the Z axis. So for instance, S in Shift Z means it'll scale outward, but not up and down. All right, so everyone's got these basic transforms down. The last time we did the noob tutorial, we did basic editing. And this time I want to do basic sculpting because Sculpting is something where you only need to know a few tools in Blender after this very bare bones setup. And you can actually start having a shitload of fun. So I really enjoy teaching sculpting. Let's create a brand new scene with Control N or File, New Scene. And let's start using this cube as the basis for our sculpture. We're going to have to do a few basic setup things first. For instance, I'm hitting N to bring up my Properties panel. And way down here, under shading, there's a button called Matte Cap. I'm going to turn that on. This basically replaces all the OpenGL shading with just a uh, normal oriented picture. So it's going to say, if there's a polygon on the screen facing upward, use this upward pixel. If it's on the bottom facing downward, use this downward pixel. If uh, it's on the left, use this leftward pixel. And on the right, this, word, this pixel. And this essentially just makes it very, very fast so that you can sculpt with a lot more detail on the screen. 
So you, if you click on this thumbnail, you can see there's other options that are pretty fun. The next thing we have to do is go down to object mode and switch our mode to sculpt. Next, we have to get symmetry on this, which is going to mean that if we are sculpting a head or something, we only have to sculpt one eye socket and it'll do the other eye socket. So go under symmetry and lock, which is on your tools panel. So hit T if you're not seeing your tools panel. And one of these is going to be a pull down menu called symmetry lock. And you just want to make sure that X mirror is on. It should be on by default. Does everyone have this set up so far or need help? No? It's down here on the 3D viewport. Oh, okay. And then switch from object mode to sculpt mode. Anyone else need help with the sculpt mode? Yeah. In sculpt mode. And then there's shading. Matte cat. Okay. Anyone else? Alright, you're in sculpt mode sculpt and you're on that cap. Click on the symmetry pull down. <coughs> and you have X axis. Well, Matt, how are you? You got that? So this is the last button we have to turn on, and then we can start having some fun. Under Dyne Topo, again, this is on the tools palette. There's going to be a pull down called Dyne Topo. That stands for dynamic topology. Click that down and click the big button that says enable dynamic topology. What this does is it means that as we sculpt, if our sculpture compared to the pixel ratio on the screen means that we don't have enough detail, it's going to just jam more polygons in there so that we have something we can mix and match and move around. So with that, use your left mouse button and start drawing on your cube and orbit around to see a different thing. Everyone got this and everyone noticing a symmetrical sculpt going on? Hopefully so. Now we can start getting into just the, the nine or ten things you need to know about sculpting to just have fun with it and run, run wild. Uh, one thing I'm going to do is under dynamic topology, I'm going to turn on smooth shading, just a personal preference. Uh, and that'll make it smooth all the normals out. So it's under Dynetopo, smooth shading. If you don't want that, it's totally fine. The first thing that you need to know about sculpting is how to change your brush around. So you'll notice that this might be a little uh, small for you. If you hit F, It'll change the size of your brush. That's this pixel value up here. But I'm using the F key to make my brush smaller or larger. And then in addition to that, you should know that Shift F changes your brush strength. So if I hit Shift F, I get this sort of pull down menu. Way down here at 1% is 100% opacity. And down here at zero is zero percent opacity. So you can just start at like 0.28. The next shortcut you should know about sculpting is that shift and left click always is a quick access to the smooth brush. It's a separate brush that you can actually go in and select, but it's so common in 3D sculpting that it just has the default hotkey of shift. So if you ever need uh, more smoothness, hold shift and it'll smooth. And then control will brush in the opposite direction. So you'll notice that as I left click, it's pulling outward and control will push inward. Mm. Just 
Happy trees, right? This is already pretty fun, right? Uh, it might just be a giant pile of goop, but it it does a lot of cool stuff. Bob, use shift to smooth it out. Shift, shift and then left click. Like he's, use left click like a brush. Look at that, it's smoothing it out. Oh yeah. So how do we advance beyond this, right? Well first off, way up here at the top of our tools panel, on this brush icon you notice that there's this little picture of uh, how the sculpture works. You can click on this and see all the other brushes. And if you want, you can just use hotkeys to go through them. One through one through zero on your number line will change your brush. Whee. How did you get the coloring? Oh, I changed my mat cap. So this is the default one, I think. And I just went and I clicked on this. And you can choose any of these thumbnails and it changes how it looks. Very fun. And don't forget, if you want it smoothed, that's under the Dyn Topo tab on your tools panel. There's just a little checkbox called Smooth Shading. So like I said, you can change your brush either by clicking on these icons or using number pad or a number line to rapidly switch between all of them. But let's start with just clicking on it and looking at the important one. The first one I think is fun to look at is snake hook. Snake hook is a more organic, immediate way to sculpt. You'll notice that I can do things like just grab this guy's entire head and yank it up. So what if these are like catfish, catfish uh, whiskers? I can just quickly grab them and move them. Well, this is another thing that is worth talking about now, which is how to change what your sculpture is doing. So you'll notice there's this tab under Dine Topo that says subdivide collapse. And I'm going to change this to subdivide edges. So, so right now what's happening is if I need more detail, it'll add more detail, right? The problem is if I need less detail, or if I'm zoomed out, it'll also assume I'm trying to get less detail and just delete everything. We don't want that. So for now, I'm going to uh, turn it to subdivide edges. I usually keep it on subdivide edges all the time, except for when I'm specifically trying to clean up things with an eraser-like uh, reduction in polygons. And then I switch it to subdivide collapse. You can also change this detail size to be smaller, such as 6. And that'll make it more sensitive. So if you're not getting enough detail out of your brush, you can do that and you'll get more. Catfish whiskey. Everyone got the snake hook down? You're already clearly masters of snake hook. It's not just useful for things like creating, I don't know, a giant sort of cat ear. Yeah. Or a giant neck coming out the back. Lying. Uh, it's also useful for just subtle transitions such as you know what if I want this guy's mouth to be up more or down more what if I want his eye socket to be a little more inward I can just grab it and pull it in and notice how I'm constantly giving the proper view before I do this so snake hook pulls in the direction of the screen so if I want to pull this eye socket inward I have to be sort of a 
in a profile view. And if I wanted to pull it inward, I want it to be in this view. The clay strips brush is another one that's really good. And I like this because it builds out form very slowly, but in an organic sort of way. So you can see I'm starting to add uh, a brow muscle here, maybe a nice corrugator muscle. And I can start getting even more detailed stuff like, where's my kitty cat nose? I'm just going, I'm just going where the model takes me. This is called cloud drawing when you do it on paper. But it started to look kind of cat-like, so I'm going in that direction. And this is where our sculpting is really, really fun. And it's why I like teaching it to beginners, is you don't have to be actually that well versed in Blender to start having a lot of fun sculpting and have your sculptures turn out something that's a pretty cool looking mesh, right? I can also again hold control to go in the opposite direction. And I can make my brush stronger if I need more depth. Another one that's good to know, especially now that I have this form of this eyebrow built out, is the crease brush and the pinch brush. So the pinch brush pulls polygons together. So if I just, I think of it like zipping a seam, I can just go along this eyebrow muscle and it'll sort of zip shut, right? And this also highlights why the smooth brush is so important enough as to deserve its own immediate hotkey of shift, right? A major process for this sculpture type stuff is step one, you do the brush stroke and you overdo it. You make it too strong because step two is you just go over it a little bit with shift. So I can pinch this nose and then use shift to smooth it out over there. This is uh, not a good looking cat. It's starting to turn into the, uh, the plastic surgery cat lady. start adding ear innards here. You know, a good rule for painting overall, not just sculpting, but just painting in general, is 90% of the time, assume that you're using too small of a brush. You want to use big brushes and do the broad strokes, and then clean up the mistakes inside of it, rather than needle away with a tiny brush. Other good ones to know are, uh, let me show you a specific one that 
requires a bit of cleanup. Actually, the fill deepen one might have been improved. So the fill deepen tool, you'll notice that I was brushing it over this whole area and it's ignoring a lot of the stuff I'm painting over because it's assuming uh, sort of a, a predefined idea of what's the farthest height of one of these polygons is going outward. Don't go past that. <clears throat> and so it brings this eye out, but it doesn't affect my eyebrow. Now you're seeing examples of why I love the snake hook tool, which is I can very quickly make this uh, dynamically different mesh. More muzzle, must know. So the flatten contrast tool, uh, I actually don't like very much, but there is something that it does that I, I'm, it's an effect that I'm going for, and I actually get it with the scrapes peaks tool. You're trying to get sort of a chiseled look, a very sculptural look, and with the scrapes peaks tool, you can get it very fast. So. This is uh, an example of where you might start digging into the layout a little more, or the, the fancier tool settings. I can go down into my curve and change this to a super harsh curve, right? And now, I can brush on here, and I brush on here, but I don't brush this sort of intersecting seam that I'm making here, and therefore that's going to start having a chiseled look. So if I run it along a seam, it's going to destroy that seam, but it's going to make it very flat. I can do it on that side and then this side. Or, you know, I can make this currently very round whisker shape, a lot more mechanical looking by doing it first on one side and then on the other. And it gets that very chiseled rock look very, very quick. And you know, I'm, I'm basically watching for where new border seams are getting created. As I do this, it starts creating a hard edge there. So once I've done that, I try to respect it and only work on this other side. Or carved wood. Yeah. Something like this pull, like you can see where I did my cat whiskers and it's got this artifact. This is where I might go in and use subdivide collapse to clean that up. Or you know, I can also maybe uh, let's do a little bit of clay strips. No. If you suddenly lose all your tools, know that there's tabs within tabs. So over here I have these side tabs of the tools, the options, and the grease pencil. So sometimes I'll middle mouse wheel over these. And I'm like, oh no, where'd all my brushes go? Just know that <coughs> they're up here. And this is where the brushes go. So to clean this up, I might go over and change this to subdivide collapse. And now I can just, I'm going to switch to a clay brush and it's just on smooth. And now when I go over this, I'll start trying to make it It'll destroy polygons so that the amount on screen fits the notion that I want, right?
I know that sometimes it's going to get confused because it might send a polygon through to the other side. And that's where you get things like this. So if you just hold shift and smooth it, it cleans it up really nice. Look at that, nice and clean now. Inflate, deflate is another one that's good to do, especially after using something like clay strips. So if I do something like, I don't know, let's just add some sort of ridged pattern here. I'm using strong clay strips. <laughs> so if I do that, I have some sort of clay strips looking thing now. I could actually inflate this and it's going to move each polygon towards its neighbors. So if I do this along the seam, I'll start doing something like that. Or rather, if I want this to be a super hard seam, I might start by pinching it. to get these polygons really close to each other. I'm going to go back to uh, I'm going to go back to subdivide only. Subdivide edges. So you'll notice that now those are very harsh edges. And now if I use the inflate tool you can make it super, super hard to the point where it's like bubbling over. The crease tool is kind of similar to the pinch magnify tool, except it does have a pulling in and pulling out uh, aspect to it. So if I use the crease tool, I'm going to switch this to control so I'm pulling outward. You'll notice that it's simultaneously pulling outward polygons and sort of pinching them towards each other. So I'm using left click on that and then control left click on this one. Now I'm starting to get a weird ridge. Cool. Control to pull out, left click to push in. Control, left click to pull out, so on and so on. So now I'm getting a really cool ridge. And this is where you can really see the effects of inflate. So I can just go over this whole thing. So a lot of times I use this on stuff like lip seams and it'll make like the lips sort of collagen towards each other and then you have like a nice lip seam. And again you have these little errors but you can smooth them and you can also use subdivide collapse to clean them up. Before there was an add remove detail brush. They kept on talking about it. Yeah, that would be cool. That's what I need to talk about. Oh, what did I do?
So another brush that's really handy is actually not a brush, but it's the mask tool. And there's a couple ways that you can set a mask. And what it does is you're basically painting an area where you say, I don't want to affect this region. Uh, and that lets you have a nice clean translation. It's just like using select tools in uh, an image processing tool. The first easiest way to access it, in my opinion, is the lasso mask. So let's say I wanted to work on everything except this eye socket. Or let's do, uh, I don't know, everything except the nose. I can hold control and shift and left click and it will mirror this and select everything er, and mask out the nose. You can also use the mask brush. I think you can. Is there a mask brush? There it is. And this lets you do things like use shift to paint on, con uh, shift just like when you use shift to use the smooth brush. Shift on the mask tool actually uses the smooth mask tool. So left mask to paint, control to erase. And why is this useful? Well, because now I can do something like go back to my other tools, such as the clay tool. The, yeah. Let's use the, the clay tool. The clay tool is like the default brush, the sculpt brush, but it's a little more subtle. And you'll notice that it's ignoring the masked area. So I can very quickly get sort of a region. There's also a menu for the mask, so you can do things like invert the mask or clear the mask. Stuff like that. So another example of where I might want this is, uh, you know, here on his lips, your upper lip, especially on a cat, actually has an overbite aspect to it where it goes over your bottom lips. And that's something that's sort of hard to sculpt because somehow we need this to come out and then connect. So I might use the mask tool to just make sure this one area is masked out. So that now, if I use the clay strips brush, actually I'm going to really quick, I think I got a little bit of mask on there. So now if I use the clay strips brush, I can use this to build that area up that overbite. Clay strips is the best brush. Yeah, it's pretty good. I think snake hook's the best. Brush fine. What's their favorite? Two Pokemon enter. Only one. And now, if I clear that mask, you can see I've got that overbite a little more installed. Or Vice versa. Instead, let's say I invert that mask, and now I have these polygons, and I ignore these other ones. So now I can do something like use the snake hook tool, and like really pull this upward. I can smooth this a little bit, maybe uh, inflate and smooth and pinch. It's good to uh, try and start thinking about like recipes for 3D because usually This stuff is not just one, you're never going to use just one brush and then it all comes together magically. It's going to be that you use a combination or a recipe of four or five brushes. Almost always smooth is going to be part of that recipe. All right, so that's the basics of Blender plus the basics of sculpting in a nutshell. Hopefully this is enough to
to help you launch into doing other fun stuff. Uh, I really like sculpting in 3D. Uh, it's something where I'll just do a tiny little half hour sculpt <coughs> before bed sometimes. Because uh, you can be really free and nonsensical and you know, you can cloud draw. And just to show you how versatile it is, let's say I want to make this into like a cat body really fast. I'm going to change this to subdivide and collapse. Uh-oh. <laughs> Oops. No. Demo effect. You use the inflate and deflate. Yeah, but I like getting this sort of basic ridge for So very quickly, you can actually use this for pretty big projects, right? Especially if you're like looking at some some concept art, and you know there's like a shoulder blade here. Go to the zoo, draw animals. It's probably more valuable than learning 3D shortcuts in the long run. I can just slowly build this sort of Lion cat up. I'm going to create a little nub here to start the leg. One thing people always mess up on quadrupeds is they think, oh, a human being, that's a broad shouldered thing. I know how to draw a human. Therefore, I'm going to have a cat with legs way out here. And you have to understand that humans uh, evolved to be the first ever sort of upright walking things in the history of well, creatures. Yeah, I mean, well, that are kangaroos. Well, yeah, I mean, there's, but even kangaroos have a tail, so they're able to have a spine that goes horizontal and just droops. We have to have this bowl shape that holds all our organs. So as a result, humans are actually very broad for an animal. Well, there are also a lot of you know, uh, the turkey is one that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe your guys' turkeys. Do you? Uh, I'm talking about living turkeys. Sure you are. <laughs> Let's make them really. <coughs> this is really quite fun, by the way. See, like, this is not a long thing to sculpt. It's very fast. Okay, sneak up. Animal control might be up here. Sorry. I'll do this from the side view. Alright, okay, whatever. I'll leave it like that. Yeah. By the way, if you click on something over here, and then you go back to this mode, it's important to know that dynamic topology will turn off. Oh, they fixed it. Maybe it doesn't. If you tap into edit mode, though. All right. Ugh. I want zero clipping. Joey, why is it clipping? I think your viewport has just moved.
That's weird. Cat patches are the best. Touch them and then you bleed, right? Because they hate it. <laughs> Alright, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk about, I don't know, something else. Uh, I brought my HDI there. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, see? Camera. Uh, people were asking about it last time. So.